Tonight, Omar Khadr caught making a video call to Al-Qaeda supporters overseas. I'll show you the evidence. It's February 12th, and you're watching The Ezra Levant Show. Why should others go to jail Why? when you're a biggest carbon Thanks consumer not. I know? There's 8,500 customers here, and you won't give them an answer. You come here once a year with a sign, and you feel morally superior. The only thing I have to say to the government for why I publish it is because it's my bloody right to do so. Shocking news tonight. Omar Khadr, the convicted Al-Qaeda war criminal, who is out on bail pending a long-shot legal appeal, Omar Khadr is communicating with other Al-Qaeda activists overseas that he met while detained in Guantanamo Bay. Here's a photo taken from a pro-terrorist Facebook page. It shows Omar Khadr on an iPhone doing a video call with another former Guantanamo Bay Al-Qaeda supporter now living in the UK named Moazam Beg. That's Beg with the beard on the far left-hand side. And you can see Cotter on the iPhone. Like Cotter, Begg freely admits that he supports the jihad, that he personally attended two different terrorist training camps in Afghanistan, that he bought weapons for the jihad, etc. Like Cotter, Begg was captured in the war against Al Qaeda and was held as an unlawful enemy combatant in Guantanamo Bay, where he met Omar Cotter. And like Cotter, he's been released. Since then, Moazam Beg has become a leading pro-jihad activist in the UK. It's what he does. He is a full-time propagandist against the West, against the democracy, against our military. He's still an Al-Qaeda asset in a way, but in the West now, undermining us from within, not from Afghanistan. He's more effective that way. Of course, we don't know exactly what they talked about on their video call, but you can see the subject matter of their discussion, Guantanamo Bay. Specifically, the 14th anniversary of that facility being set up. Here's the caption on the photo from the pro-terrorist Facebook page. Did you guys see this? Zainab Khadr, Maha El-Samna, Mariam Khadr. Omar joined Moazam on FT for Gitmo 14-year anniversary. Now, let me explain those words a little bit. Zainab Khadr is Omar Khadr's pro-terrorist sister. Maha is his pro-terrorist mother. Remember those two? Why is it? Why does nobody say you killed three of his friends? Why does everybody say he killed an American soldier? A big deal. Charming. So they were copied on this Facebook post, as is Mariam Cotter, Omar Cotter's younger sister. So the whole family knows about this little terrorist chat. FT presumably refers to FaceTime, the video phone feature on an iPhone. And as you can see underneath, Cotter's mother replies that, yes, she knew all about the conversation. Quote, yes, I did. May Allah bless them and protect all. So Omar Cotter, Al-Qaeda terrorist and murderer, is doing video calls overseas with Moa Zambeg, another Al-Qaeda supporter that he met in Guantanamo Bay. And Cotter's pro-terrorist mom supports it all. This must violate his bail conditions. Talking with other Al-Qaeda extremists? Or does it? When Qatar was first let out on bail, the conditions were strict. He had to live with his lawyer. He had to wear a trackable ankle bracelet. And he had to let police monitor his computer. And he couldn't talk to terrorist supporters, including even his own family, without his lawyer present, and then only in English. Those were other, there were other restrictions too, but Qatar complained to the courts, saying that ankle tracking device, it was getting in the way of him playing soccer. Seriously, that's what he said. So a liberal judge agreed and let him take off the ankle tracking bracelet. He said the police tracking software on his computer interfered with some of his programs. Yeah, of course it did. But a liberal judge ordered the police to take that off too. Then another liberal judge uh, said, yeah, you can go on an airplane. <laughs> like putting Al-Qaeda terrorists on a plane never killed anyone before. But hey, why should our liberal judges be any less in love with this terrorist than our liberal media. Just last November, McLean's Magazine put Cotter on their cover, on their Remembrance Day edition, posing next to real victims of violence, calling him a victim too. So now he's conferring with other Guantanamo Bay de detainees and Al-Qaeda activists. Is that a breach of Cotter's bail conditions? Well, I wrote to Cotter's lawyer, Dennis Adney. Here's my letter in full. I said, dear Dennis, 
I have a photograph that appears to show Omar Khadr talking via video with Moazam Beg, the former Guantanamo Bay detainee. I want to make sure I get my facts straight before I broadcast the story. Number one, did Khadr talk to Beg? Number two, do you know what they discussed? Three, is Khadr permitted to talk to Beg or other former Guantanamo Bay detainees under the terms of his bail or other legal conditions upon him? Number four, how often does Cotter talk to other Guantanamo detainees? Number five, were you aware of this? Was his bail officer? Is there anything else you or Cotter would like to put on the record? Yours gratefully, Ezra Levant. Well, Edney wrote right back to me. I'll read you his entire letter. It's just 15 words. He said, Dear Ezra, quote, You have misdescribed me before, so with all respect, I do not wish to participate. Regards, Dennis Edney QC. Well, that's weird. I mean, I always describe him as Cotter's lawyer and a pro-Cotter activist, which he is. But what's any of that got to do with my question? My question wasn't about Edney himself. It was to Edney in his capacity as Cotter's lawyer. Did he know about this video call? Is it legal? Does his bail officer know? How often does this happen? So I wrote back to Edney again. I said, Dear Dennis, thanks for writing back so promptly. Is there another lawyer or agent for Cotter? who can answer these questions. My goal is accuracy and fairness. Well, I've received no reply ever, no reply ever since, just, just silence. Now, I have never met another lawyer as chatty as Dennis Edney in my life. Sometimes I wonder if he spends more time doing law or doing media interviews about doing law. He's a chatterbox. He gives speeches. He's voluble. And it's almost all about Omar Khadr. He loves Khadr, not just as a client, but as a friend. He lets Khadr live in his own house. But you know what? I, I think Edney did not know about this video call. I think underneath all of Dennis Edney's radical activism, I think Edney is a man of the law who follows the law, who would abide by the bail conditions, who wouldn't try to trick police or evade ceases. I truly think my email shocked Dennis Edney. I truly think that he had no clue that his client, Omar Carter was talking with other Guantanamo Bay inmates, other Al-Qaeda supporters, because I think that's illegal, and I don't think Dennis Edney would knowingly let his client break the law. I think my email deeply troubled Edney because it shows that Edney's love affair with his client and his narrative that Carter's just a little lamb who has long ago left the life of Al-Qaeda behind him. Oh, he was just a kid. He didn't know what he was doing. Well, that whole narrative is false. Edney believed it with his whole heart, as does every left winger so desperately. But Cotter was tricking Edney, lying to him just as he's lied to everyone else. Omar Cotter has never renounced Al Qaeda or the jihad or his father's terrorism, Ahmed Cotter. And now we have photographic proof that Omar Cotter is still in touch with Al Qaeda and that his mother knows about it and supports it. Look, if Dennis Edney, Edney gets back to me with anything more, I will let you know. But until then, I think we've got to go with what we have. Omar Khadr is conferring with other Al-Qaeda supporters overseas, and he's keeping that a secret from Canadian authorities. Omar Khadr's mother is a part of it, or at least she knows about it and approves of it. Omar Khadr has tricked us all. Well, not all, just the media and the courts, and I think his own lawyer. The rest of us always knew he was an unrepentant terrorist and murderer. He belongs back in jail. If you want to look closely at this Facebook image, which has since been scrubbed from the internet, we have a copy of it saved on our website, which you can see by clicking here or by visiting jailcotter.com. Dot com, jailcotter.com. That's what we have to do. Put him back in jail. He's a murderer and a terrorist. Why should it be surprising that he's also a liar, hiding things, perhaps even from his own lawyer? Visit jailcotter.com and sign our petition to throw this terrorist back in prison where he belongs. I love Alberta. I've lived here my whole life and I'm proud of it. I'm proud of our free market, pro-business, low-tax, do-it-yourself attitude. 
And now, I'm watching my province get destroyed. We've all had hints of the NDP's radical views in the past, but no one actually thought they'd ever run this province. Not even them. And now they are. And the worst is yet to come. I give my sad forecast for Alberta in my new ebook, The Destroyers, Rachel Notley and the NDP's War on Alberta. Hey, welcome back to the program. I want to take you to Vancouver, BC, which was the site of a brutal battle between all the tax-funded elites and grassroots taxpayers, namely over a transit tax, the kind of thing the left just loves, but the people didn't. Joining us now via Skype to give us the latest is Jordan Bateman, who's the BC director of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. Jordan, great to see you again. Hey, nice to see you, Ezra. Thanks. Uh, when we talked to you uh, in the recent past, you were heading up the campaign against a TransLink tax. Now, all I need to hear is the word tax, but can you refresh our viewers' memory of what TransLink is, what this tax was going to do, and how the fight went down? Sure. So TransLink is the uh, transit monopoly that runs most of the transportation system in the greater Vancouver area. So some of your uh, listeners or viewers may be familiar with SkyTrain. They operate that. They operate the buses. They own some bridges. Uh, they operate two passenger ferries called the C-Bus. They operate a commuter train. So they're a $1.4 billion a year organization. Uh, headed up by an unelected board with uh, a bunch of meddling from the provincial government and the mayors of the region. And they decided that they wanted to do a $7.5 billion expansion plan. And to fund it, they decided that uh, all of us in the Lower Mainland should pay a 0.5% sales tax, which of course would have been historic in Canada because no other city or region has its own specific sales tax. So this had to get approved through a, a plebiscite, thanks to a, an election promised by Premier Christy Clark. And uh, pleased to report that despite them outspending us $7 million to $40,000, despite them having 175 groups and all the power brokers, uh, the people spoke up and defeated that tax uh, with a resounding vote of 62%. That's amazing. Well, thanks for the recap. Uh I wanted to do that because one of the things you guys were su so successful at was showing the incredible waste in TransLink. Just like you say, unelected, unaccountable. For, hey, free money. I mean, they had a CEO who was too like shockingly overpaid. So they sacked them and had another CEO, but the old CEO. So they had two CEOs on payroll so they could say, well, look, our new CEO costs a little bit less, but we're still paying the old CEO. Like crazy, crazy stuff. Well, here's the news now. It sounds like they've hired yet another CEO, bringing someone in from Seattle, Washington, at $365,000 a year. That's pretty good money to run a few buses and trains. But tell me about this new CEO. His real skill seems to me, it's not really about running trains, it's about getting tax increases for trains, am I right? Yeah, I mean, that's one of the major skill sets he brings. His name is Kevin Desmond. He's actually the fourth CEO TransLink will have had in uh, 365 uh, days. So four uh, CEOs. He comes from Sound Transit down in um, Washington State. Um, and, you know, he, he, under his watch, the agency did get a hold of uh, two or three new tax increases through plebiscites there. Now, his record is very spotty. Um, that, that group uh, only delivered about one-third of the promised transit improvements that they said they would deliver with that new tax. Uh, so there's some daylight there as to, as, or some question there as to what he was, what he was doing with the rest of that money. Uh, he also lost some transit plebiscites. But his main job here will be to try to restore some faith in, uh, in TransLink, which uh, frankly, is at an all-time low in popularity and has seen a, its entire executive suite uh, cleaned out uh, since we won that, uh, that plebiscite victory. Yeah. Well, it's incredible to me. And when I, and I saw your note about it, I thought, well, if he was able to win tax increases in Seattle, I mean, listen, you don't, there's no special skill to running 
uh, a transit system that Americans have that Canadians don't. We have plenty of transit here. It sounds like his special skill is that he was able, able to stick it to taxpayers there in the way the Vancouver team has not been able to. I predict that they'll take another run at the referendum with this guy, maybe using some of his experience in raising taxes in Seattle. But listen, I want to talk about one more thing before we let you go. You and our friend Hamish Marshall led the battle, and as you mentioned, you were outspent, what, 20 to 1, or is it 200 100, to 1? 170 to 1, Ezra. Oh, my God, I didn't do my math right. 170 to 1. All the fancy people, David Suzuki, all the big government unions, of course, because they want the money to, to spend on themselves. Only the people were on your side. In fact, that's the title of your book, right? What's the title of the book? The title of the book is Everyone But the People, and it's the story of how uh, everyday taxpayers, how we uh, defeated all of these elite groups, academics, environmental groups, unions, government, uh, uh, both the provincial uh, governing party and opposition, we defeated them all and, and sent this tax packing. So that book is out today? Is today the day that the book debuts? That is, that's correct. It's uh, available exclusively through Amazon, and people can go to uh, notranslinktaxbook.com, or I understand Rebel has a link as well set up, so uh, lots of ways to get a hold of it. Great. So Amazon.ca. You know, we've got our own book on Amazon right now by Sheila Reed called The Destroyers, which hit number one on Amazon. I hope your book hits number one, too. You're going to have to push Harry Potter out of the way for that. Um, Give me just a little bit about the book. Is it about the battle? Is it about your campaign tactics? Is it, is it sort of an insider's take on your war room? What, what's the book about? Well, Hamish and I lay out the uh, campaign strategy, the plan, the tactics, the way we tried to earn media attention, and, you know, uh, the, kind of the tools that we gave the everyday people so that when they talk to their uh, friends and neighbors about this tax, they knew what they were talking about. Um, it turns into a bit of a love letter, to be honest, to those everyday people uh, there's lots of great stories in there of how they took our message and ran with it in ways that we never expected. Um, but, you know, the problem with it in Vancouver is because all these power groups were on one side, they've been sort of writing the history of this campaign, claiming that we were the favorites all along and nonsense like that. We felt it was important to make sure that people knew the real story of the campaign and, and that for historical purposes, uh, uh, the, the victory of the everyday people are, it will be remembered. Yeah. I have no doubt that your book will be bought by many people in TransLink, including this new American CEO. They'll try and crack your code, figure out how you did it, and, and figure out how to turn those tactics to their own advantage. I don't think it'll work from them, because at the end of the day, severely normal people know that a tax hike is always uh, you know, bundled in happy promises, but really it's just about increasing the scope of government. Listen, Jordan, I'm proud of you for the campaign you fought. We loved covering it as it happened. Thrilled for your new book. I hope it's a bestseller. And folks, you heard it there. The book is called, I mean, get this title right, Everyone But the People. Uh, that's a saying from uh, W.A.C. Bennett, isn't it? Everyone was against yeah, them but the people. W.A.C. Bennett used to say that, uh, oh, they've got everyone on their side. They've got everyone but the people. Yeah, well, that's a, there's a showbiz saying, too. Everyone hates it but the public. And I think you caught the wave this time. Good for you. That's our friend Jordan Bateman, the BC boss of the Canadian Taxpayers Federation. I recommend the book. I haven't read it myself, but if it's anything like his interviews, it's a must read. Thanks for joining us, my friend. Thanks for having us. All right, stay with us, folks. More after these words. Looking for the perfect gift? Did you know the rebel.media has a store? Make a statement with a t-shirt. Have your morning coffee in a fearless travel coffee mug. There's even an Ezra Levant bobblehead. It's a one-stop shop for the perfect gift. And don't forget to pick up something for yourself. Go to the rebel.media slash store to find out more. Ontario residents are being hosed on electricity prices. The latest Auditor General's report says we've been overcharged by $37 billion over the last several years. That works out to nearly $2,800 for every man, woman and child. Why? Mismanagement and bad policy choices from the Ontario Liberals. It's going to cost us billions more in coming years. Energy Minister Bob Shirelli won't take responsibility. He's lashing out. It's time for Bob to go. If you agree, go to firebob.ca. That's firebob.ca and make your voice heard. Welcome back to the show. You know, there are a lot of strange 
policy moves coming out of Ottawa that seem very radical. Now, I accept that Justin Trudeau ran on a radical campaign platform that very few people read, but there's one particular proposal that was never mentioned in the campaign, yet it's being rolled out by Trudeau's immigration minister, John McCallum. And joining us now via Skype to talk about it is our friend, Candace Malcolm. Candace is a fellow for the Canadian Global Affairs Institute and a columnist with Sun Media. Great to see you, Candace. Great to be here. Well, you wrote a very troubling article in the Sun Media newspapers about a new language barrier, so to speak, that the, the Trudeau Liberals want to put up. I mean, tell us in, in a nutshell this radical proposal, and, and that's John McCallum's own word. What is this radical proposal he wants to bring into our immigration laws that was never in any campaign platform. That's right, Ezra. It was never mentioned during the during the election at all. And John McCallum himself says it's radical. They want to get rid of the language requirement uh, for people becoming Canadian citizens. So right now you have to pass a very basic, a uh, very easy French or English test in order to get citizenship in Canada. It's always been that way. We've always had the expectation that newcomers learn our language. It's one of the reasons why Canada actually has a successful integration model uh, when it comes to immigration. It's one of the most successful aspects of Canadian immigration policy. And all of a sudden, uh, the Liberals say that they want to get rid of it. They say it's too burdensome. Uh, we don't know the details exactly. John McCallum just sort of hinted that it's coming within the next couple of weeks um, and that some of his Liberal MPs are complaining that their constituents think, think it's too too burdensome to, to learn a little bit of English or French in order to become a citizen. So uh, what, what, what McCallum and Trudeau are suggesting is that a person who doesn't speak a single word of French or English can now become a Canadian citizen. It, it's outrageous, Ezra. I, I couldn't believe it when I, when I heard it. It is incredible. I mean, being a citizen should not be burden free. I mean, uh, it, you shouldn't be a slave to the state, but if you come to our country, we have two official languages. And, you know, I'm so sorry that someone <laughs> would be asked to go through the burden of learning one of our languages. Hey, tell you what, don't go to the burden, go to another language, uh, go to another country where they don't ask you to speak English and French. I don't know what those countries are. Maybe it's Europe, but that's the thing, Candace. If you look at countries that have no burdens, no obligations on immigrants whatsoever, especially language, you'll see ghettoization where there's no integration, they're, they're not truly becoming part of the nationality, and that leads to all sorts of social ills, whether it's crime or just ethnic separatism, which is what you're seeing in France and Germany. This is about making immigrants successful. And if some would-be immigrant doesn't want the burden of learning English and French, fine. There's, I'm sure there's plenty more who would accept those burdens, am I right? Right, then don't come. I mean, uh, you're, we're ultimately doing a disservice to these newcomers if we tell them not to bother learning French or English. It's a very important part of the integration process uh, in order to ensure that future generations are successful here in Canada. Uh, exactly what you're talking about, official multiculturalism, the cult of official multiculturalism, in, as we see in, in Europe, in Germany, there's third generation uh, people who, who have been living in Germany that aren't citizens, that don't speak German, uh, that are completely ostracized. And do we want that in Canada? No. Of course not. And language is an incredibly important, uh, even symbolic aspect. When you come to Canada, learn French or English, you start to integrate. It helps you economically. It helps you fit into your community. It, it's just, it, it's common sense, Ezra. And the fact that the liberals would all of a sudden announce out of nowhere that they don't think it's important anymore. Uh, you know, I think that there's a political element to this as well. I think that they're basically saying, come to Canada. We're going to take away all the all the rights and responsibilities of your citizenship, just hand out citizenship and hopefully create lifelong liberal voters. Yeah. Uh, that's, that's what I see when I, when I look at this policy, and I think it's a, it's a huge mistake uh, that's going to have consequences for a very long time to come. It's so strange. I mean, how are you going to make a new friend if you don't speak the language? Well, you're not going to. You're going to only talk to other people in your ghettoized community. How are you going to get a job? Like, how would you even know that a job was available? How could you apply for the job? How could you work at a job? How could you interact and integrate? How could you even do that? What kind of person would say, I am not going to learn the language, it's too much? Oh, yeah, it's a burden. <laughs> if you don't want the burden, don't come. I, it's, I mean, just looking ahead to all the social and economic dysfunction this, that this will insist on, that this will directly lead to, just from a practical point of view, it's a disaster, let alone the moral point of view. You know, there's something that 
Justin Trudeau said in his loving interview with the New York Times a couple months ago, you know when he was doing all these, wow, he's so handsome interviews with Vogue and New York Times, he said that Canada does not have a core identity. He said that, I don't have the verbatim quote on hand here, but he's trying to make that happen. He's trying to, and even taking away language, which is so bizarre because he's from Quebec. Tell a Quebecer that French is not uh, an important part of their culture, and they'll call you uh, an anti-Quebec bigot. And here you have the federal liberals saying, no, 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 you don't have to learn French. I mean, it, I, I, I'm not an Anglo pride activist. I'm just saying it won't work. How do you think this is going to go over in Quebec, Candace? Have you seen any pushback in Quebec, or are they still madly in love with the boy prince Justin Trudeau? I, I can't imagine it goes over well. And as we know, Canada spends $2.4 billion a year pushing official bilingualism, teaching English Canadians French and French Canadians English. It's, it's bizarre that all of a sudden uh, the Trudeau government would say to newcomers, don't bother learning either. I can't imagine it's going to go over uh, well in Quebec. And, and Trudeau is wrong when he says that Canada doesn't have a core identity. Of course we do. Of course we have our own values, our own identity. Language is a key part of that. Uh, you know, Trudeau's pushing out this bland official multiculturalism uh, myth. It's, it's not even true. And I think that it, he's doing a disservice to the entire country, to, to newcomers and to future generations. If, if they grow up thinking that there is no Canadian values, there is no Canadian culture, and you can just import uh, any foreign values that you want uh, and supersede our values here in Canada. It's, it's wrong. It's wrongheaded. And I think it's a huge mistake that the liberals are, are even flirting with this idea. I, I hope they change their course before they actually implement uh, this, this this disastrous policy. Yeah, it, it is a disaster. I, I just, I mean, I don't think that this government is being scrutinized yet by the media. I think they're still in honeymoon mode. And it, and I grant that when you win an election, you have a certain mandate, but this is so outside the lines, so counterproductive, so slapdash. I think John McCallum, it's only been 90 days he's been minister. I think he is already a failure. Everything he touches is a fiasco, especially the rush for refugees. And this sounds like a mad dream he had. Well, listen, I really appreciate you bringing this news to our attention, Candace. Thank you very much. And uh, look forward to talking to you again, even though I find your news very upsetting. It's very important that we hear it. Great to see you again. Thanks for having me. Right on. Stay with us, folks, more after these short messages. I'm so open-minded that the brains have fallen out. What's the point that you're making? The point that I'm making is that if you're going to propose a massive overhaul to the way the economy is, is developed in terms of carbon tax, cap and trade, other forms like that, it helps to have some science that is in fact settled. We've heard you loud and clear. You can't get enough Canadian conservative news and opinion. Why not check out our blog? It's all your favorite conservative bloggers together on a page called The Megaphone. Go to the rebel.media slash The Megaphone or click on the Megaphone menu from our main page to check it out. Welcome back. My favorite part of the show is viewer feedback. Lloyd responds to my show from last night about the Alberta NDP and job losses. He says, for the next three and a half years, don't let up on those incriminating news clips of the destroyers. Hi, Lloyd. They are destroyers, but just for people they don't like, such as farmers or oilmen. As I showed yesterday, if you are a union member, government union, not a private sector union. If you are in a government union, this is the best time in history to live in Alberta. 50,000 government union jobs created in Alberta last year, including more than 8,000 in December alone. So yeah, that's one of our editorial goals, to show what Rachel Notley is doing. And of course, Justin Trudeau hasn't even begun his war on the economy, especially in Alberta. I'll keep showing you videos. And as you know, Sheila Gunn-Reed's new book, called uh, The Destroyers, hit number one on Amazon.ca. Can you believe it? That's how thirsty people are for the facts. Joe Schmo, obviously a pen name, I think so, writes about Twitter's new safety rules. Now that the CRTC has vetted out the Sun News Network, he says, we need an internet watchdog to do the same to the rebel. 
I applaud Twitter for starting the movement to silence hate speech and bigotry on the internet, and I hope it grows beyond social media. Hi, Joe. I, I love your hate mail. I really do. It tells me that even though you don't agree with us, you are obsessed with us. I mean, you're always writing, which tells me there's something psychological going on here. I think you know we have something of value to say. I predict one day you'll come over to our side, but it might be a while. As to your comment, there is some truth to what you say. The CRTC vetted out the Sun News Network, in your words, as in they didn't give us the same CRTC license and mandate that they gave to CTV's news channel and uh, CBC's news channel when they were launched, namely forcing every cable company in the country to put those channels on their basic cable package and forcing every cable subscriber in Canada to pay for that, whether they watched uh, it or not. So you're right. And that's 100% the choice of the late Conservative government. You know that if Jean Chrétien were Prime Minister, he would have ensured that a liberal all-news channel would have had lavish treatment by the CRTC. Stephen Harper didn't lift a finger. So, yeah. But as much as the CRTC's war against Sun News was a shame, it led to the creation of the rebel. It's like we were thrown into the deep end of the swimming pool. We either drowned right away or we learned how to swim. And so I got to tell you, next week, is our first year anniversary. We've learned how to swim, and our viewership now is much, much larger than it ever was at Sun News. More than 100,000 visits a day on average. Uh, maybe 10 of those visits are yours, Joe. But your point about calling for an internet watchdog to censor us gives you away. You're not a liberal. Liberals may disagree with us, but liberals would debate us, maybe try to convince us we're wrong, or maybe they just ignore us. You, Joe, can't convince us or convince others, so you want to shut us down by force or worse, you want a government powerful enough to shut us down by force simply because you disagree with us. It's scary that people like you exist, Joe, and are growing in number, I believe. Rick Lowen tweets, Ezra Levant is officially a sideshow. Maybe GOP is looking for a Canadian right-wing stooge. Wait, where's David from? Hi, Rick. Thanks for watching. I'm not sure what you mean by a sideshow. I think that means that there's a main show that I'm next to. I don't know what you mean. I'm not a member of any political party, by the way, not here in Canada, nor, of course, in the United States. I hope the Republicans do win the next U.S. election because I think Barack Obama is wrecking America and endangering the whole world, including us. I haven't seen David Frum in years, actually, but I follow him closely online. He's a senior editor of The Atlantic magazine, which is sort of a big deal. Anyways, um, thanks for watching. Hey, what do you think? Do you think I read too much hate, hate mail? I sort of like it. I mean, I don't want to just read fan mail. I mean, I want to acknowledge your kind words of support, but I don't want to just read people agreeing with me. I will try to find smarter, tougher criticisms in the future, but I tell you, most criticisms of the show are just strings of insults. If I get smart liberal emails, I promise I'll read them. Anyways... What do you think of our big scoop today? Omar Khadr talking on a video phone with Al-Qaeda supporters overseas, including Moazam Beg, someone he met in Guantanamo Bay. What do you think of that? That doesn't quite jive with the image of the little lamb, Omar Khadr, that McLean's Magazine and the CBC and the Toronto Star and liberal judges have propagated, does it? I wrote to Dennis Edney saying, what's up? Is this real? Do you know about it? Does this violate his bail conditions? Give me something. And he wrote me back 15 words saying, I'm not talking to you. Yeah, well, I think that tells me all I need to know. Omar Khadr is obviously unreformed. I mean, if a man is willing to kill you, he just might be willing to lie to you too when he says he no longer does that sort of thing. But to his credit, Omar Khadr has actually not lied about who he is. He has not reputed Al-Qaeda or terrorism of the jihad of his father. He won't. It's other liberals who put those words around him. They're so desperate that he reforms himself to prove that their own liberal worldview holds up. I think Dennis Edney will be troubled by this news. I think it surprises him, and I think it proves that he was duped by his own client. If I hear anything more from him, I'll let you know. But do go back to our website, jlcotter.com. See the picture for yourself from Facebook. And if you haven't signed it already, sign the petition to put that terrorist back behind bars. That's it for me. That's it for all of us for this week. We'll have more content for you over the weekend. Monday's a holiday. We'll still have videos to watch. And our show resumes in full on Tuesday. Have a great weekend, everybody. Until next time, keep fighting for freedom. Bye-bye.